As we continue our reflections on the book of Exodus today, we have been following the Israelites now for eight weeks or so, and they have been rescued from Egypt. They've seen the power of God deliver them from Pharaoh. They've walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. They've received manna from heaven and quail have covered the ground. And then in the few verses we skip, God made water come out of a rock when they were thirsty. And story after story is there to remind the Israelites and us that our God can save, that he is their deliverer, that he can be counted on, that he will be with them and provide for all of their needs. But today in our text, the Israelites faced a new challenge. They confront some raiders, Amalekites, who have been attacking them. And for the first time in Exodus, God says, I will deliver you, but now you need to get something on the line too. You need to go fight. And so the Israelites go into battle against the Amalekites in Exodus 17, beginning at verse 8. Hear the word of our Lord for us today. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held his hands up, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekites' army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered, and make sure that Joshua hears it, because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, Because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we reflect together on your word today, we ask not that we might hear the words of men, hear the words that our own minds can, can, can concoct and form, but instead that we might hear from you, that you might speak by your spirit into our lives, convicting us of sin, but also inspiring us in new acts of obedience and reminding us again of your grace. We pray this all in your Son's name and by the power of the Spirit within us. Amen. When you read the Old Testament and don't skip over these stories, the Old Testament creates all sort of ethical dilemmas for us as believers. Because in the New Testament, Jesus says that we are to turn the other cheek and love our enemies. But in the Old Testament, God tells the Amalekites, wipe, God tells the Israelites, wipe the Amalekites from the face of the earth, kill them all. How do those two ideas fit together. In the New Testament, Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. In the Old Testament, God says Moses and Joshua and the judges and King David out to kill all of their enemies and says, David is a man after my own heart. How do those two things fit together? Some people have tried to answer that question by simply ignoring the Old Testament and they say, well, that was then, before Jesus, but now that Jesus came, everything is different. And it's hard to argue with that logic, isn't it? Because everything is different since Jesus came in our relationship with God. But that seems to imply that God changed after Jesus came, that God would do this in the Old Testament, but now he's a different God. I'm not sure I want to follow a God who changes that drastically so quickly. Maybe that's not a good answer. Other people have said, well, what's going on in the Old Testament is God is revealing himself in time to the people of Israel. And so in that moment, they needed to be violent. They needed to defend themselves. They needed to go to war. 
Otherwise, they still would have been enslaved because they were a small political group of people. They needed to go to war. But now, God's people are the church, and they're part of every nation on earth, and they're scattered throughout the world in this loosely connected network of the body of Christ. And for Christians to go to war now, they'd be fighting other Christians, so it no longer applies. We shouldn't go white people from the face of the earth. Maybe. Maybe that, that's a point we should consider. Others simply fall back on the absolutely true statement that whatever God says is just because God is God, he decides what is good. So in the Old Testament, it was good to wipe people from the face of the earth. In the New Testament, it's not. We don't have to understand why, just obey. It's really hard to argue with you should do what God tells you to do, so we're not going to today. And I'm not going to pretend that I can answer this vexing question, how do we make the old and the new fit together? We'll just be troubled by it for a while. What I'd like to do instead is look at this specific example to figure out why is God so angry at the Amalekites? What did they do that made God say, this group of people among all of the people in the world, I want wiped from the face of the earth. I want them gone. What did they do? It may help first to know who the Amalekites are. They pop up very early in the Old Testament. Amalek, the father of the Amalekites, is the son of Eliphaz. And now that that's straightened out, we can keep moving on, can't we? Eliphaz is the son of Esau. And we know who Esau is. He's the brother of Jacob, the son of Isaac. So when the Amalekites attack the Israelites, this is a family squabble. They're distant cousins with one another. And so the family is at war in some way. So after this battle in Exodus chapter 17, God says, I'm going to remove the name of Amalek from the face of the earth. That's how angry he is. It's the only time that I could find where God says, I'm going to wipe an entire people group out. They're the only people he promises to destroy from the face of the earth. So you might wonder, is God true to his word? Did God follow through on this promise? Or was it like a parent who says, if you don't quit that, I'm going to, and then they never follow through. This is what happens in 1 Samuel 15. In 1 Samuel 15, God tells King Saul to attack the Amalekites. And he says, when you do so, you need to kill every man, woman, and child, every sheep, every goat, every living thing among the Amalekites, and destroy everything they owned. Wipe them completely out from the face of the earth. So Saul attacks the Amalekites, and he defeats them. And then we read in 1 Samuel 15 this. Saul took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. And all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to completely destroy. But everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night. So Saul obeys God, sort of, He kills most of the Amalekites. Now the Amalekites keep showing up. David fights against them too. So in this battle, he killed all of them but Agag. And he kept all of the good stuff for himself. And God is so angry with Saul for not obeying that at this moment, God decides to take the crown away from Saul and give it to David. We don't want to overstate this. God takes the throne away from Saul because he disobeyed the direct commands of God not simply because he didn't destroy the Amalekites. David doesn't destroy them completely either. But when he's given a command, Saul ignores it and does what he wants, so God takes the throne away. But it is interesting that when God gives the command to completely destroy the people, it's the Amalekites that he says to completely destroy. So a few hundred years later, Saul is supposed to destroy them. Then the north and south split. The two kingdoms eventually are both destroyed. The refugees from Judah go to Babylon. And then we read this fascinating story in the book of Esther. In the book of Esther, we read of a man named Haman. 
This is the story of Esther, you recall. Esther is the niece of Mordecai. The king gets rid of his wife. Esther gets raised up to become queen. Mordecai and Haman have a feud. And this is what we learn about Haman when he's introduced. After these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all of the other nobles. So Haman is the son of Hamadatha, who is the grandson or great-great-great-grandson of who? Agag. Who is he again? Oh, the king Saul was supposed to destroy the head of the Amalekites. So Haman is an Amalekite. Haman has this big confrontation with Mordecai. Haman plots to destroy the Jews. Everything gets turned, and Haman ends up being impaled on the 75-foot spike that he built to kill Mordecai on, and God deals with Agag's descendant. Does God take this promise seriously in Exodus 17? A thousand years later, he's still hunting down the Amalekites. God meant it when he said, I will remove their name from the face of the earth. So what did they do? What did they do that was so bad that God had to get rid of the Amalekites? It's only them. The Israelites fight against Moab and Edom and Egypt and Assyria and the Philistines and the Hittites and the Jebusites, but none of them have to have their name removed from the earth. It's only the Amalekites. We find our answer in Deuteronomy 25, verses 17 and 18. This is what Moses says to the people of Israel on his last speech before he dies. Moses says, Remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and attacked all who were lagging behind. They had no fear of God. So this is what Moses said happened. Have you ever gone hiking with like a lot of people of varying ages? I got to do that this summer in Israel. We were about 30 of us in a group. And one of the people had, had MS and struggled to walk. Some of them were in their 70s and some of them were, one of them was a 19-year-old college kid. He annoyed all of us. He never got tired. Okay, so this is what would happen. We would get up and we'd go hiking in the morning and at the beginning of the day, we were all together because it was 75 degrees and it wasn't that hot yet and we weren't tired yet. And by nine in the morning, the little 20-year-old or 19-year-old college kid was in the front with the guide and the 70-year-olds were not even in sight, honestly. You couldn't find them. They were way behind you because they were tired. And the person with the MS would give up and she'd go back on the bus and they'd drive her up to where we were going to go. She didn't even walk because you can't keep up sometimes. For the Israelites, they're going in the desert day after day. And some of them are 18, 19, and 20-year-olds and they are in great shape and they're not injured and they're not old and they're not carrying newborn babies and they're not sick. So as the day progresses, they get further and further ahead and the line of Israelites gets spread out. The Amalekites are staying in the hills in the desert, hiding behind rocks. And when the Israelites go by, they let them go by because the people at the front are strong and fast and will fight back. They wait until all of the strong people have gone by. And then when the, when the mother with a newborn who's nursing her child while she's walking to keep up goes by, and the 80-year-old grandma goes by, and the injured man go by, they come and pounce and kill them. And that's why God is mad. He is not angry that the Amalekites fought Israel. Lots of nations fight Israel. God is mad because the Amalekites attacked the weak. The Amalekites killed those who could not take care of themselves. That's why God is mad. And so for us today, one of the questions we need to ask ourselves are, who are the weak in our midst? Not much has really changed, has it? The elderly are still often the weak. They're the ones who get pushed to the side and not listened to. The young are the weak. No one lets a five-year-old go vote for president, but they're going to pay all the bills, right? They don't have a whole lot of say in things. 
Those who are disabled are the weak. I read just this week that the unemployment rate for the blind of working age in our nation is 76%. 76% of people who are blind cannot get work. Even though they're working age and they're looking for it, they can't find Because that's, that's those looking, not those who gave up, 76%. Could you imagine if the unemployment rate for us was 76%, how mad we'd be? They are the weak. We talked about the refugee resettlement program just a few minutes ago. I can't imagine anyone weaker than those who can't speak the language and don't have the education we have and don't have any family resources to fall back on and come to a nation on their own to figure it out. They are the weak. We could add to the list the unemployed, those who are sick, those who are dealing with cancer, um, those who are homeless, And the list could go on and on. And today, we could, if we wanted, leave feeling really bad. Because let's be honest. Can you solve the unemployment problem for those who are blind? You can't hire all those people, can you? Can you make every refugee find a job and have a stable home and get their life back together and process all of the pain and suffering they've experienced? No, you can't. No matter how hard you work, you will not meet all of those needs. So we could leave today feeling bad that we failed. Wouldn't that be a great way to end church? We're all bad. Or we can leave today going, but you know, I can't do everything, but I volunteer with the refugee family so I can leave feeling pretty good. I'm one of the good people. It's those other people who don't, who are in trouble, right? We could do that. We could leave feeling self-righteous about ourselves because we're the best because we did one thing one time. So now we're, we're, we're off the hook. But let me suggest that God's word isn't given to us so we can leave feeling bad about ourselves, going home with our tail between our legs, or so that we can leave feeling really good about ourselves that we're the best because we did something one time that was really good. I think God's word is given to us to help us see our world differently, to begin to see our world as God does and begin to live as God would have us live in heaven but do it already here on earth. So what might it mean for us to be the people who care for the weak? What might it look like? There are a group of people who are weak in our community that all of us face every single day. This past week, the sports world spent the whole week talking about the Miami Dolphins because there's an issue of bullying on their team. Jonathan Martin, a second-year offensive lineman, left the team because he said he was being bullied. Richie Incognito, the one who was apparently, apparently the lead bullier, was kicked off of the team, and everyone's talking about, well, what does that mean, and how should people act on a football team? And I've never been on a football team. Seriously, I've never been on a football team. (laughs) I would last like one play, and I would just pray it was the cornerback. I'd just let the guy score, and then they wouldn't let me play anymore, and that would be fine by me. So I don't know what it's like. But it is interesting, from reading things that were said, it's hard to argue that the things that were done and said were vile and reprehensible and disgusting and racist, and I don't know what to do with any of that, so I won't answer that, that, those issues. But let me make an observation. Who's the weakest person on a sports team? The new guy. They're not known. They don't have any of the social connections. They don't have any of the support from the other teammates. They're new. They don't know anybody. They're on their own. No matter what position they play, they're the weak guy. And that's true everywhere we go. Whoever's new is usually the weakest one in a group. They don't have the long history of relationships. They're an unknown commodity. They don't know the rules of wherever they're coming, whether it's school or work or your family or your church. They don't know what to do. They need someone to help. How do you treat the people who are new in your life? How do you treat them? I remember when Rachel and I were engaged. It was a week before our wedding. We got married between Christmas and New Year's. We were with her family celebrating Christmas. And I have phenomenal in-laws, in part because of how they responded to this story. So we're celebrating Christmas, and it's Rachel and her brother Josh and her sister Deb and me and my sister-in-law Rachel who's married to Rachel's brother Josh. It's very confusing because at one point there were two Rachel Knots in the family with the same middle initial. So there was no good way to figure out who was who. So that's who's there with the kids. And my mother-in-law says, Josh and Rachel and Deb, will you sing for us O Holy Night? Which 
is something you need to hear someday. They've sung their whole lives in church. They sing, Oh Holy Night, a cappella in tight three-part harmony. It's awesome. But no one else was allowed to sing. In fact, I didn't do this because no one wants me to sing. My sister, Rachel Ann, sister-in-law, sings very well too. She wanted to join and she got shushed. She got shushed because this was for the kids. And then my sister and I had one, sister-in-law and I had one of those in-law moments where you look and you know what the other one is thinking and we both thought we'll never be part of this family, right? Because everything about it said, the kids who were born to us count, you guys just sit in the corner and don't talk. So that's what we did. It's true, all right? The beauty of my in-laws is my brother-in-law said to his mom, that's not okay and it's never happened again. They changed and they welcomed us. Sometimes we don't see what we're doing that exclude people. When in your family, when someone new joins, when an in-law comes into the family, do they get treated as one of your own? Hey, how are you doing? You should come over here. I bet we can find your mommy and daddy because I bet you want to find them, don't you? We have a little child who needs a home. Can we have a mom or dad come find them because I think they might get scared soon. Do we know where you need to go? Steve will help us out. Thank you. Hi. I'm so glad you're up here. We don't want any kids wandering out into the street or anything. But when when you have someone new in your family, how do you welcome them? Do they feel like they are as much a part of the family as someone who's there by birth? Or do the in-laws in your family know that no matter what the law says, they will never be an in-law, they'll always be an outlaw when they gather for family meals? How do you welcome those who are new in your family? And when you're at work or at school, we were talking with one of my sons this week, and he made the comment that it would be hard to be the new kid in school after kindergarten or first grade. Because in kindergarten, first grade, everyone's making friends and figuring out what they want to do on the playground. But after that, people kind of have their circle of friends and they know what to do at recess and they have their patterns. And if you're new, it could be hard to figure out who to play with and find someone who would let you join. I would suggest to you that what's true in second grade is true when you're 45 in a job too. When you're new... It's hard to get included. How, have, how do you welcome the people who are new where you work or in your class? Do you invite them out for drinks with everyone for a happy hour on Friday or do you engage in a little office gossip about the new guy? What do you do to include those who are new? I was thinking about that, that all of this this past week and Sunday morning last week actually I had one of these realizations because you might have noticed there were a lot of us here on Sunday because we had three professions of faith and one of them was a baptism and people sat in the front row. No one sits in the front row because it's just there to block your legs. That's why it's there because it makes people uncomfortable to have their legs exposed. So that's why that row is there. No one ever sits in that row. But people did last week because there were not enough seats otherwise and it was fascinating to watch some of you because people sat in your seat. They did, didn't they? They did. I have a seat too. It's the third row. I want to point out today I'm not in my seat because the Zoots want the third row too and we don't all fit. And then when they sit there, I have to move. (laughs) I don't know why people do that. Of course, they would say the third row is their seat and when I sit there, they have to move. Why do people do that to them, right? How do you welcome people who are new in church? What's really sad as your pastor, this was why I thought about it all last week. I know when we're going to have baptisms and professions of faith because, well, I plan the service, right? It's never a surprise to me. And I know that we'll have visitors who want to sit in the front. And it wasn't until last week I had the realization, I should sit further back those weeks so the people who are coming to see the baptism can have the good seats. It is hard to think about things from the perspective of someone who is new. We get used to how we do things and we forget that someone who is new isn't included in that. I was having lunch with a good friend, Doug Doug McClintock, this past week. He preached here this summer. He is 
influential in church planting movements in our regional synod. So we were talking about those kind of issues, and he made a comment that apparently he made here this summer as well. He said, you know, it's not enough just to be friendly. You have to make friends. It's not enough just to shake someone's hand on a Sunday and say hi, and then look for your real friends to talk to after church. You have to invite the new person you said hi to into your circle of friends. And it got me thinking, how do you spot a modern-day Amalekite? Amalekites today aren't using spears and rocks and swords. They use the tools of exclusion, of gossip, of turning a cold shoulder, or just ignoring those they don't already know. They may be friendly, but they'll never be friends with you. I think one way to tell whether or not you're an Amalekite is to look at your group of friends. How many people do you regularly socialize with and spend time with that you just met in the last 10 years or the last year? And how many of your friends have you known for 20 or 25 years? If you only have friends who are lifelong friends and you don't have any new friends, I'd suggest you're an Amalekite. Because that's not how people who follow Jesus live. Jesus was known for being a friend of sinners, a friend of tax collectors and prostitutes. He hung out with the blind and the lame. He touched the lepers. He welcomed the little kids. The complaint people had about Jesus was he would be friends with anybody. That's what people didn't like about him. And the only people Jesus ever condemns are the ones who exclude. The ones who say, so-and-so isn't good enough to be a part of our circle. Those who think that they're good enough in their religion that others can't join. He calls them whitewashed tombs and a brood of vipers. They're the Pharisees. They're the religious folk who don't welcome those who aren't good enough yet. And it makes me wonder, if someone watched me all week long, would they think I was from the tribe of the Amalekites or from the tribe of Jesus? Would they say, that's someone who's a friend of sinners and the outcasts and the losers and the ones who don't fit in and the ones who aren't connected, or is that someone who always wants to be in the inner circle and has his core group and no one else can get in? I wonder what they'd say about you. I wonder what they'd say about us as a community. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are not an Amalekite, that you welcome the sinners, you welcome the broken, you welcome the weak, you welcome the mess-ups, and the screw-ups, and the lost, and the confused, and you have called us your children, that you have reconciled us to you through your Son. We ask this week that you would help us to show that same grace and that same love to those we meet, that in us they might get a glimpse of the ever-expanding love of your kingdom. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen.